invite you to remain standing, and we're going to focus ourselves uh, with a call to worship. A call to worship is an opportunity for us to kind of set aside what we've been thinking about and doing for this whole week and enter into and focus on the presence of God. And to do that, we are going to share some scripture together. So throughout this series, we are sharing and reading together uh, the Beatitudes and then praying together the Lord's Prayer. So I want to invite you to do that with me as the words are on the screen. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Will you pray with me the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you continue your worship as we sing together our opening hymn, I Love to Tell the Story.
Amen. I uh, have a few things to say about our topic of Jubilee and fall kickoff. And I was standing here right next to the organ, and Jubilee is announced with trumpets. And it gives you the sense of grandeur of the moment that God is ushering in Jubilee. And the organ does a great job, so thank you for that this morning. Uh, it's a powerful moment. Fall kickoff happens every year here at First Church. This congregation sort of takes uh, a threshold moment where we're coming back from summer, a lot of change in schedules, and we reorient to some consistency. This is often a time when life groups start meeting again. Our life groups will take a break oftentimes in summer or just shift their schedules. But this fall kickoff is a great opportunity to begin meeting again weekly. We will have a sermon series beginning on Sunday, September 8th. And there is a resource that we have developed, the members of this congregation have developed, and that is to walk us in step with Jubilee. So you may have seen this at the back table. There might not be any copies left. So I just want to let you know that there will be more copies next week. They're just, uh, they take a while to print and bind. So there are copies of this devotional resource. They'll also be online and on our app as well. They'll be published there. But essentially, every week there will be a topic and it will be with a core psalm. So we'll be studying the book of Psalms. Last year we did Romans and you might have remembered that in previous years Genesis and Proverbs were focuses of our study. And if you know anything about the Bible, you'll kind of think Jubilee and Psalms, how do those things go together? They don't really, Jubilee is in Leviticus 25, doesn't make sense. And you would be right to say that because Jubilee doesn't occur anywhere in the book of Psalms. But what we do see in the book of Psalms is every single principle of Jubilee, the image that God wants for flourishing life, embedded with every single hymn and every single image of God that we get in the book of Psalms. So that's how this devotional study is structured. We'll be going through the Psalms looking for the principles of Jubilee that God gives us in Leviticus 25 in step with our sermon series. So if you don't yet have one and you can't get one yet today, there will be more next Sunday, but again, on our app and our websites. If you are part of a life group, then this would be a time for your life group to study this together. If you are not part of a life group and you're interested in maybe learning more about that, I would love to have a conversation with you and we can talk more about what it means to be a part of a group that studies scripture together and develops relationships together in deeper and new ways. I believe that uh, what I would like to invite you to this, for this fall kickoff is to ask yourselves and ask us as a church to challenge us what it looks like for us to live as people of Jubilee. One of the primary ways that we get to do that is through prayer. Let us now come to God with open hearts and minds humbly approaching the God with this prayer. God, you are righteous and just. We hunger for you, Lord. We thirst for you. We seek today what only you can make right and just. Only you can satisfy our hungry hearts, drawing us closer to you. Our appetites reveal our hearts, which often seek satisfaction in what this world offers. But what our hearts really desire is for your fullness and goodness to over overcome all the hurt and suffering that is occurring. We seek your righteousness to guide our every move. We desire for your will to be done to absolute fulfillment. Guide us in doing what is right and just so we may display your goodness and power in all that we do. God, you are merciful <clears throat> and your love and you love us all unconditionally. May we extend your mercy to others today and tomorrow. May your spirit stir inside us <clears throat> and burst into action. God, afford us the many opportunities to work for you, showcasing your love, forgiveness, and mercy to those who may seem undeserving or in those moments that seem not so ordinary. May you move in all of our ways to show compassion to those experiencing sin's misery. Only you, God, can move in the most powerful ways, guide our path and actions, so that we may be more like Jesus in all things big and small. And God, you are pure in all things good. Lord, cleanse our hearts today, forgiving us for our sins that we have committed, making us once again pure. With our pure hearts, we are able to fully focus on you, your love, and fully enjoy all things from you and glorify you. 
We long to experience the deepest fellowship with you, seeing you working in all things today. We see glimpses of you when our hearts are cleansed and pure, seeing you in our work, our loved ones, in ourselves. We see your spirit move in the mundane in the, and also in the miraculously life-changing moments. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness and unending love that you give to all your people, every one of us, no matter how deep our hurts go or how terrible our sins may have been. You forgive us and give us eternal life through our belief in you. The power of sin is broken through Jesus Christ, making our fellowship with a pure heart in God restored and renewed. Amen. We want to invite you to continue in an attitude of prayer. Sometimes we speak our prayers with words as Ashley just let us. Sometimes we are silent in the presence of God, and sometimes we sing our prayers. We want to invite you to sing your prayers as we join together in singing two hymns. The first is an invitation to come into the presence of Jesus. And the second is a familiar tune, but with some different words, um, words that line up so well with Matt's message this morning. So I invite you to continue in an attitude of prayer as you remain seated and sing together.
Our scripture for today is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, or falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For the same way they persecuted the, persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Wayne. We want to give opportunity for any of our kids who want to make their way this morning to, part, to Spark Zone to go ahead and do that. Uh, Miss Courtney is in the back area, and so kids, we invite you to go back and join with her and to share together in a time of learning and diving into God's Word together. For all of us in this space, I also want to invite us to dive into God's Word. And so if you've not had a chance to pull up the scripture uh, that Wayne just shared on his phone, I invite you to do that or sh pull out the Bible that you might have so that we can dive with one another into what God will be sharing with us here this morning. As we get ready to do that, would you join with me in a word of prayer? Let us pray. They are the first words in the most extended sermon that Jesus gives us in Scripture, which is the Sermon on the Mount. So because these words are the introduction to this long sermon that Jesus gives, that is another way of saying that the Beatitudes are really, really important. So we're taking some extended time to dive deep into these words that Jesus shares with us. And we're studying these words at this particular time because we all know that it's incredibly easy in our world and culture to be pulled towards the kingdom of this world rather than having a focus on the kingdom of God. And what these Beatitudes do is they focus us, they ground us deeply in the kingdom of God as opposed to the kingdom of this world. Now when Jesus shared these Beatitudes, what he is telling us over and over and over again is that this, these words, this description he gives us, this is the blessed life, right? That's what he keeps saying, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. It's another way of saying this is what the good life really is, not the artificial uh, realities that are proposed in this world. But you and I, when we hear these descriptions that Jesus gives, if we're really honest with ourselves, there has to be a part of us that's like, really? Is it really blessed to be merciful, pure in heart, mournful, fill in the blank? Is that really what the good life is? So a key question that these Beatitudes are going to force us to ask if we take them seriously is, well, then what is the good life? Like, really? Really? What is the good life, and what will we do to pursue it? Now, I'm totally going to date myself here for a few moments. When I was growing up, there was a certain show on television with a, in my opinion, rather catchy theme song that I think captured a lot of the sense of our culture's sense of the good life. Now, I'm going to spare you here this morning from singing it. You can thank me later for doing that. But I am going to share some of the lyrics with you, and at least for some of you, I'm curious if you recognize what theme song and show these belong to. Here are the lyrics. Well, we're moving on up. <laughs> to the, oh, wow, you're right. Wow. They, yeah, you, I, 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 I'm impressed. That was like three words, and you're like right there. If you don't know it, to the east side, to a deluxe apartment in the sky... Moving on up to the east side, we finally got a piece of the pie. 
tell me, what show did that belong to? Yeah. Hey, exactly, you're all over it. Now, for, if you're of a certain generation, Google it or ask AI for help, all right? And you'll, you'll, you'll find out, because I know not everyone will know that. When I was growing up, that was right, the theme song of the Jeffersons. The good life was pretty much understood by the life of the Jeffersons, moving on up, having more luxury, having more comforts, gaining more status, moving on up. And for many, that is the good life. For others, the good life is found in having freedom to do what exactly you want to do. For others, it's the good life is found in the defining of your own identity. For others, it's human flourishing. But in many, many instances, you and I do our best to define for ourselves what the good life is. Part of what we discover in this world is that this world says you or we get to define the good life. But the point of the Beatitudes is that it's Jesus who defines the good life. Jesus defines the good life. So let's try to understand together what this good life then really entails. And part of what we hear then is already what, what Wayne has started to share with us here this morning. In verses chapter 5, verses 6, 7, and 8, we heard, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This is a radically different picture of what we normally conceive of as the good life. Dallas Willard, the great spiritual formation guru that we have referenced before, makes this argument about the good life when it comes to Jesus and the Beatitudes. He claims, I'm going to put this quote on the screen, this is deep but it's so good. He claims that the Beatitudes clarify the fundamental message of Jesus, which is God's rule and righteousness is freely available to all of humanity through reliance upon Jesus himself the person now loose in the world among us as a result of the resurrection. Now let me read that one more time, because that's a mouthful, but it's so significant. The Beatitudes clarify that the fundamental message of Jesus is God's rule and righteousness is freely available to all, to all of humanity through reliance upon Jesus himself, the person now loose in the world among us as a result of the resurrection. Now, why is that a big deal? Why did I actually have us read that twice? Here's the answer. What the Beatitudes show us is that they show us from a human point of view that those who are often regarded as most hopeless, those in the most broken of places, those in the darkest of places, even they can enjoy God's touch and God's provision among them. And that's a really, really good thing. It's not just those with luxury. It's not just those with things. Even those who are broken and in merciful places and with purity of heart or any place that the world tends to look beyond, even they have access, say the Beatitudes, to the good life of Jesus, and we rejoice in that. That means even those without any apparent hope those without any apparent possibility in their lives from an earthly point of view, even they have access to the kingdom of God in God's favor, and that is really good news. So that in this way, the Beatitudes are good news for absolutely everyone because in proclaiming the Beatitudes, Jesus showed that no human condition excludes God's blessedness. No condition is so bad, so broken, so beyond God's blessing and favor that God's favor cannot still come to them and be delivered to them. So that no matter what state you find yourself in, God's love is extended to you, with you, among you, and that is good news. That deserves God's amen. See, the religious systems of Jesus' day, they left the multitudes out. They pushed out. They excluded. But Jesus welcomed all into his kingdom. The love of Jesus extends to everyone, those privileged and not so privileged, to the blessed in this world and the non-blessed in this world. God's kingdom is open to all. And it's really only good news if it's good news for everybody, for everyone. 
I would say of both political parties. <laughs> Take it from Jesus himself. So today we're going to try to understand what Jesus is sharing with us, how God is present with us even in the hardest of places, even in the darkest, most desperate of places, so that we can understand how the Beatitudes are really good news for everybody. Because the reality that God is found in the hardest places, that's some pretty darn good news. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to do some zip lining with Zach. It was just he and I. And on the day that we got to go, it was a beautiful day. Uh, but it was hot. And as you can imagine, if you're zip lining, they don't let you take a whole lot with you. So we couldn't take food, we couldn't take drink. And we were doing this for a couple hours in the afternoon, and it was a hot day. And we were getting, you know, it was great, but we were getting tired and hot and thirsty. And so imagine our joy as we finished the end of the one zip line, and there at the base of the tree was a big orange cooler filled with ice water and cups. Do you know how good it was in the midst of our tiredness and our weariness to drink that cool water? It's one thing to sit in a comfortable room and have a nice glass of water. It's another thing when you're tired or hurting or at the end of your rope, literally, and suddenly there's this refreshing water. That's what God is sharing with us in these Beatitudes. In those broken, hot, hurting places is the living water to drink. It reminds me of the phrase from Corey Ten Boon. We've talked about this before, but this is so powerful. You know that Corey Ten Boon was in a concentration camp. She was a survivor in the Nazi regime. She experienced all the horrors of the concentration camps. Her sister Betsy did not make it out of the concentration camp. And yet, in the midst of the horrors that she experienced, Corey said this. She said, we must tell people what we've learned here in the concentration camp. She said, we must tell them there is no pit so deep that he, that is God, is not deeper still. And they will listen to us because we have been here in the deepest, darkest pit. We've been here in the worst of conditions, and even there we are blessed. Why? Because God is with us. That is a beatitude quote. This is the experience of the good life even in the midst of the worst places in life. So, so far in this series, we've explored how those who are poor, those who mourn, those who are meek, experience the good life according to the kingdom of God. Now today we're going to look at three more, and we'll only have a chance to touch on them, but this idea of hungering and thirsting for righteousness, walking with the merciful, walking with those who are pure in heart, what do those mean for us? And as we're going through these, I just want to invite you in your own life to consider how might this be good news to me? And how might I share this good news with others? So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, we hear, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now the words hunger and thirst here would have been particularly power-packed words for those listening to Jesus at this time. Remember, he was talking to Jews who were under Roman occupation. So they were second-class citizens. They were, many of them, just eking out an existence, struggling literally for good food and water. They knew hunger and thirst, especially at a physical level. But they also would have known their Bible. They also were a people who understood what Jesus was talking about when he made certain references. So you can imagine that as Jesus talks about hunger and thirst, one of the places their mind may have gone was back to the Exodus story with Moses and wandering around for 40 years in the desert, constantly hungry and thirsty. All of that would have been present in their mind as they're sharing. And so they understood the hunger and thirst for righteousness, or hunger and thirst. And then Jesus comes and says, what I want you to hunger and thirst for is righteousness. Righteousness is about doing what God has called us to do. It's about doing what is right, what is holy, and what is just. The word hunger used for, a better translation actually might be craved. You know what craving is. You desire something so strongly in every fiber of your being that it's hard to move past it. In our house, if I can say it this way, this is a poor example, but there are times that I really crave crumble cookies. <laughs> and really just, I'm like, I just want to drive over and grab one. Right? We crave it with every fiber of our being. What Jesus wants us to crave is that which is holy and just and right. 
in our world there is much that is not right, not just, not holy, which is why God's church is always called to speak out against sexism, racism, greed, exploitation, injustice in any form because they keep us from living into God's righteousness with each other. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we crave God's righteousness. It's one of the reasons that Ben reminded us this morning that in this year of Jubilee, Jubilee is all about justice and righteousness and restoration and beauty and flourishing for all. The great, amazing scholar N.T. Wright, former bishop of Durham in England translate this beatitude this way. He says, blessings on people who hunger and thirst for God's justice. You're going to be satisfied. Notice he chooses the phrase God's justice where others would say righteousness. In other writings, Wright teaches that justice, divine justice, is one of the marks of the kingdom of God. And to use Wright's words, God is in the busyness and the business of putting the world to rights because the world's been broken through sin throughout history, and so God is in the process of restoring the world, which means every person will be treated with great worth. This is part of what makes God's church so powerful, so beautiful. God uses God's church to bring restoration in our world, to bring and share goodness and beauty, to correct that which is broken, which is also why Jubilee is so important. And get this, the way that God does this, the way that God brings restoration through God's church in the world is through you, me, us. We are the ones who are are supposed to reach out to the oppressed, comfort the depressed, feed the hungry, clothe those who don't have clothing. And we're not only just to do it because we should, We're to crave it because those things aren't right in the world. And so God says, church, you crave my justice and holiness in the world and join with me to bring restoration. Then, when this hunger for righteousness is satisfied, many will be blessed, including you, for that which is right. If you've never done it, take some time and talk to somebody who's done our Code Blue experience in January, February, March. What's easier, to sleep in your own bed, in your own home, or come and sleep with 15 to 30 other people and being up a good part of the night and not knowing what you're going to encounter during the night? And those at Code Blue will tell you they show up in spite of their own comfort, to do that which is right, to offer justice, to offer dignity, to offer beauty. They hunger and thirst for righteousness, and they are filled. Same could be said for anybody who served to transform. What's easier, to take a day of vacation and relax, or take some time off so you can come and sweat and work hard in our community? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Or those who serve at first night every week, what's easier, to relax on a Wednesday afternoon or to come and prepare meals for those in our community to hunger and thirst for righteousness? And the same could be said for all those who pour out their lives for our kids and for our youth and in so many other ways, hunger and thirst for righteousness. And in each one of those instances, despite any hardships that you hear, part of what you will also hear is a filling, a blessedness because they are in line with God's desires in our world, bringing justice and beauty and restoration in our world. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Is that us? Then we hear this, Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, mercy can be defined as either offering forgiveness when it's not deserved or withholding punishment when it is deserved. So sometimes people have said that grace is getting what we do not deserve. If grace is getting what we do not deserve, mercy is not getting what we do deserve. I was struck some months ago by a true and sordid story uh, that a friend of mine had shared with me that to me demonstrates powerfully what mercy can look like and what it entails when it's offered to another who does not deserve it. And the key here is does not deserve. There's a pastor that I know whose heart 
for those who do not know Jesus, it's just so intense within him. So much so that sometimes when he's even talking with other individuals who have not encountered the love and grace of Jesus and have not welcomed that into their lives, it causes him to literally weep. He so desperately wants everybody to know the love of Christ because of how Jesus has transformed his life. The pastor saw God's love in such an unfiltered and powerful way. It impacted how he viewed everybody else and how he tried to interact with them. In the town that this pastor lived, there was a man who was discovered to be a sexual predator and a drug addict. He lost his job. Nobody was willing to give this man a place to live. Therefore, the man became homeless. To a large degree, we could say, really, this homeless man deserved it, right? He deserved to be homeless. He was reaping the results of his actions, clearly wrong actions at that. But when this pastor heard about this sexual predator and his situation, he came to the sexual predator and he said, if you need a place to live, if you want, you can live with me. Now, the pastor had no kids at home at that time anymore, and his wife was still there, and amazingly, she said okay to this as well. So the predator moved in with the pastor and his wife. The pastor began to work with him, witness to him, shared God's love with him, helped him find a job, worked in uh, the scriptures with him in Bible study every day, and eventually that predator came to accept Jesus as Lord of his life. Eventually, that man was able then to move out on his own, secure a job, and when the time came for him, he was able to move out. Happy ending, right? Except that as soon as he moved out, that man, now without the support of the pastor, sadly relapsed and within three days passed away from an overdose. As the pastor shared this story, tears were streaming down his face out of concern for this individual who had lost his life. And then he shared these words. He said, at first I thought my job was to give him a physical home, but now I realize my job was to give him a spiritual home. I'm so glad he was able to welcome Jesus into his life. That this life here is not the end of the story. That there is more. Now, here's a pastor in an ordinary town who's an ordinary man himself at an ordinary church. And we could say that man deserved homelessness for his actions. And he did. But what he received instead was mercy from that pastor. Incredible, powerful mercy. I am amazed in that story how this pastor, who had such a purity of mercy that I would say, could see Jesus so clearly that he took on these actions of love in ways that we so often would not in our world. And I'm amazed at that pastor's mercy that God allowed him to love so unconditionally so as to see God's work in this man's life, even in the worst of conditions. And I like to think that when this merciful pastor realized that the predator had accepted Jesus, that the pastor was blessed in his own heart, despite the sadness of the situation. I wonder what offering such mercy might look like to us. Maybe not just to predators, but in all seriousness, to those in the opposite political party. Yet again, we discover the words of Jesus to be true. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And then we hear in Matthew 5.8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I appreciate how the message version puts it. Blessed are you when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right, then you can see God in the outside world. Oftentimes, I think when we think about the word purity, the first thing I'm guessing that most of us think about is some relation to sexual purity, where we deal with lust and resisting sexual temptation, and there are certainly components of that related to purity. We know that impurity in our sexual lives will lead to problems in all areas of our lives. And usually the way that I'm aware of for most individuals, we try to conquer that sexual temptation, and that includes anything from pornography to adultery. We try to conquer that through exceptional self-discipline and repression, 
almost through rational argument. We think if we can just become rigid enough, disciplined enough, have enough boundaries in place, we can deal with our temptations. If we just grit our teeth hard enough, then we'll get through it. But most of the time, in the end, those weapons prove inadequate. French Catholic writer Francois Marier once commented that sexual desire is like a tidal wave powerful enough to carry away the best of intentions. So true. No matter what he tried, Marcier said he struggled with remaining pure, and whether you're married or not, lust comes at all of us in the attraction of an unknown creature with a taste for adventure found in chance meetings, and this is only magnified in a culture in which such encounters can come simply with a click of a button. In the end, Marier said he could only find up and end up with one reason to remain pure, and it's what Jesus presents here in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. To quote Marie, he says this, Impurity separates us from God. The spiritual life obeys laws as verifiable as those of the physical world. Purity is the condition for a higher love, for a possession superior to all possessions, that of God. Yes, that is what is at stake and nothing less. Listen to what he says, a possession superior to all possessions. The key is a love greater than any other love. The key is that when we love and are in love with God Almighty, these other things pale in comparison with their pull on our lives. It's not an issue of a greater discipline to avoid lust. It's an issue of encountering in greater intimacy the one who loves us truly and fully. Impurity becomes a barrier to intimacy with God. When we pursue purity we experience intimacy with God. Now, as I mentioned, purity is often related to be a sexual issue, but it also involves issues of the heart and the motives of our heart. So elements such as judgmentalism, greed, jealousy, self-focus, all of those also can be purity issues in our heart. And when any of those hindrances to purity in our life occur, our walk with God lessens. Some of you have probably heard of Henry Nouwen. I've referenced him in the past, but it's been a long time. He was a priest, used to teach at Harvard University. At the height of his career, Nouwen moved from Harvard University to a community called the Daybreak Community, or La Arche Community, near Toronto in Canada. Now, I believe that when Nouwen went, he went for his own well-being. He went for some rest, he went for some solitude, but while there, Nouwen had an unexpected experience. He was invited to take on the demanding chores required in a friendship with a man named Adam Arndt. At first, I don't think Nouwen was too excited to have this particular friendship with Adam, and here's why. Nouwen described in his own words Adam and what it was to be with him. He said, Adam is a 25-year-old man who cannot speak, cannot dress or undress himself, cannot walk alone, cannot eat alone without help. He does not cry or laugh, only occasionally does he make eye contact. His back is distorted, his arms and leg movements are twisted, he suffers from severe epilepsy, and despite heavy medication, he sees few days without some grand seizure along the way. Sometimes he grows rigid, he utters a howling groan, and on a few occasions I've seen one big tear roll down his cheek. It takes me about an hour and a half to wake Adam up, give him his medication, get him to his bath, wash him, shave him, clean his teeth, dress him, walk him to the kitchen, give him his breakfast, put him in his wheelchair, and bring him to a place where he then spends most of his day in therapeutic exercise. Here's a picture of Henry and Adam, an old picture. Now, those who would go to visit Henry in Toronto at this community wondered, Henry, is this really the best use of your gifts? You are a renowned speaker. You are a renowned academician. You are a renowned scholar. You have much to offer the world. Is this really your best use of your gifts, taking care of Adam? Seems like such a menial task. And yet, as Nowen worked with Adam, something very unexpected happened. He discovered a growing closeness and intimacy with God in his own life. He discovered his own motives changing. He discovered a growing closeness, a growing purity in his heart with God. And I believe that what was happening for Henry to be serving Adam was a purity of heart that connected him intimately with the living God. So that eventually Nouwen was broached with this question of taking care of Adam and saying, hey, Henry, is this really the best use of your time? 
Henry got to a place where he could say, you are completely misunderstanding what's going on here. I'm not giving up anything. It is I, not Adam, who gets the main benefit from our relationship. How could that be? I believe it's because now in we're experiencing greater purity of heart by serving Adam in the ways that he did. No longer was it about Henry's motives, Henry's self-interest, Henry's accomplishments. It was more and more a singular focus on serving and walking with Adam, which allowed him a purity of heart in connecting with God Almighty. As Henry's heart changed inwardly, he saw more of God outwardly. As he sat beside that helpless child man, now and realized he was no longer marked by his own obsession. He was no longer marked by competition of success in academia in this world. And what he says that Adam taught him is this. He said, what makes us human is not our mind, but our heart, not our ability to think, but our ability to love. And from Adam's simple nature, Nowin became more and more pure in heart. And so Nowin grew in intimacy with God, and he was blessed. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I wonder this week, what would help you to experience the good life in this upcoming week? What would fan the flames of your love and your desire for Jesus? Growing out of these beatitudes. Jesus knew how life works in this world. He's offering us to live into a new world in the kingdom of God through these Beatitudes. I invite us this week to make it part of our prayer. Lord, help me to hunger and thirst for righteousness that I may be filled in you. Lord, help me to offer mercy that I might be shown mercy. Lord, help me to pursue purity that I might see you. Which of those three need to be your primary prayer this week? A hunger and thirst for righteousness, offering mercy, pursuing purity of heart. This week, let us pursue blessing and the good life as Jesus defines it. Amen. This morning, as we close our time together, we have the opportunity to sing a hymn that brings us back to our first love. The love that as we are focused on, it drowns out other things that pull at us. And so this morning, as we're able, I want to invite us to stand and sing, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Let us share together.
Amen. One of the realities of the blessed life, the good life, the life of the Beatitudes, is that we do have the opportunity to get lost in God's wonder, love, and praise. And so as we get ready to go forth this day, let us go. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, offering mercy, and pursuing purity. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.